Hello, everyone. I'm Joe. I'm a software engineer from Microsoft, and I do most of the work related to WebAssembly and bring WebAssembly to the cloud through projects like RunWazi, Continuity Wazi and Shims, and Spider Lightning. And today I will be presenting virtually with Dan from Fastly. Dan is a co-inventor of Wazen and he's the original developer of Wazi, and he's pretty much everywhere on the Wazen Wazi world. And let's first from Dan. Loud. So one of the questions we often get when we talk about Wazi in the cloud is, is Wazi just about POSIX? And before we can even answer that question, we need to take a few steps back and look at some of the kind of underlying ingredients that we need to have before we can even talk about APIs like POSIX. We need to start from a place where we have a standards forum. We're talking about APIs that many different engines will implement and many different source languages, many different tool chains, many different libraries are all going to be sharing. And so it's important for us to have a place where these many different people can come together and have consensus on a set of APIs that they'll share. And this forum will need to define vocabulary, conventions, and tools for defining APIs. And when we have this, when we have a common set of vocabulary, conventions, and tools, many different people are going to want to use this. They'll want to use the same vocabulary, conventions, and tools for their own APIs that don't necessarily have to be standards. And so it's pretty clear that what we end up having to set up here is the basis for an API ecosystem. Right now, the API ecosystem is just getting started. This is a really great time to ask a really fundamental question. What do we want of our ecosystem? What do we want this ecosystem that we're going to all share to look like? What properties do we want it to have? A natural way to answer those questions is to look at WASM itself and say, what are the things we really like about WASM? Can we have those things in the API as well? But one of the big properties of WASM that makes it really interesting is portability. WASM, of course, is portable across CPU architectures. It can run on things like x86 and ARM and RISC-V and many other different CPU architectures. Um, WASM can also run on different kinds of operating systems. When we look at the API space, the kind of use cases that are stepping up, people want this kind of portability but they say, when we have this kind of portability, actually what we want is more of that kind of portability. We won't be able to take portability beyond just like different kinds of desktop computers with different kinds of CPUs and different operating systems. But we want to have portability across fundamentally different kinds of computers. So when we look at the cloud, we want to have portability not between like different kinds of machines running inside the cloud, but different kinds of cloud infrastructure. Um, and even beyond that, we want to have portability beyond cloud, between cloud and edge. And, and cloud and edge and browser and client side and mobile devices and embedded devices. Um, kind of portability across different kinds of environments, which requires a greater degree of abstraction than just portability across the instruction set or basic operating system functionality. WASM is cross language. Um, it can support many different source languages today and it's always adding features as we go forward, We're adding more features to support more languages in, in better ways. Um, that's one of its core strengths. Um, and, and when we look at the way through cases for Wazi stepping forward, we see people want to use many different source languages. And really importantly, they want to have these different source languages be able to interoperate. We don't want to have to have fragmentation in the ecosystem between people using some languages on this side and other languages on this side. We want to have a common ecosystem where many people can combine to have the same ecosystem. Wasm starts out as sandboxed comes from browsers, which have to have a sandbox against hostile code coming from the internet. So it has to be uh, robust against this kind of attacks. Um, and so we were able to preserve this kind of strong sandboxing as we extended the API space. But it's important that we don't do sandboxes in a way that we say, run the code in a world where I can pretend that it's the only thing that exists. We want to want to have code be composable. If we look at the core WASM system with modules and imports and exports, they kind of apply a system where imports could be connected to exports. And it, it suggests a very, very composable system where you can have many different modules that can be connected together with just their imports and exports because they don't share anything else. There's no implicit shared state. The realization of all these kind of properties in the API space is the WIT IDL in the component model. So a quick overview of the WIT IDL, the vocabulary for defining APIs. 
So our core WASM has either two types, which makes sense because it's mainly a CPU abstraction and CPUs don't have signed and unsigned registers, they just have integer registers. But in the interfaces, it's important to talk about signed and unsigned values because we need to be able to interpret the meaning of the values. So we have signed and unsigned integer types. Also floating point types and Boolean types. Um, these interface types also give us uh, dynamically sized types, things like strings and lists, and just first class types we can just pass through interfaces. And these are really, really valuable for being able to define APIs. Um, the ADL also gives us types for doing records and, and variants. Um, it also has types for uh, a result type for error handling. And this is really interesting where if you have uh, a bindings to JavaScript, we can have JavaScript throw an exception because that would be the natural way to handle error in JavaScript. If we have bindings to Rust, we can have Rust return a result because that would be the natural way to handle an error in, result in Rust. If we have bindings to C, C can return a special error number, which is kind of the natural way of handling errors in C. So every language can have their own kind of error handling, and having a result type in the IDL means we can make bindings that are specialized for the different error types. The IDL also defines types for handles and resources, which allow us to have awareness of the outside world, limited awareness of the outside world. So we can share handles, which are essentially pointers, to resources, which is essentially states, and we can share these around in a very limited way that's controlled by APIs and types. And in the future, the IDL will be extended to handle async, of integrated features for streams and features. This gives us a very powerful API. To kind of get a sense of what all these types enable, um, they give us source languages that are unexposed. If you have an API that takes a list of string and returns a list of, of U8, nothing in the API says, and this was implemented by C++, or and this was implemented by JavaScript, or and this was implemented by Python. It's just list of strings, list of U8s. So these types are source language independent types. This means that the ecosystem doesn't have to worry about being fragmented along API boundaries because the boundaries of any given API, it won't matter what source language you could write in. You could talk to any other language in any other source language. Using the WASM model and extending the kind of WASM concept of modules, imports, and exports, um, and, and linking these things in, in the, the, module, the module linking system means that there's no global namespace or registries or brokers or buses at runtime. And this is one of the key properties that means that interfaces are fully virtualizable. We don't need to worry about two things needing to share a registry or needing to share a broker or needing to share a bus. Um, any of the things once we've linked them together, it can be virtualized. When you take that combination and link it with other things, and that combination can be virtualized. So at any given time after we've done some linking, we can take the result and fully virtualize it. It also means that features like GC, and also any kind of memory management, whether it's GC or linear memory, it can be compartmentalized. So we have individual components can have individual GCs. Um, of course, under the covers, some patients can be doing lots of different things. But conceptually, at the interface level, the GCs are not entangled with each other. So we don't have a common common cycles across interface boundaries, um, which will be some really interesting properties. We talk about partial failure in the future. This is also really important when we look at WASM GC, because one of the properties of WASM GC is that it's not inside the address space. It's not inside the linear memory. So if we have APIs that are defined in terms of linear memory and pointers, GC languages can't talk directly to those things. So this avoids us having to have an awkward fragmentation between GC languages on one side and linear memory languages on the other. Putting this all together, this is the foundation for a very solid WASM native API ecosystem. An API ecosystem built for WASM that takes the properties that make WASM strong and realizes them within APIs as well. When we put all these pieces together, from the standard body with the WASI subgroup, to the common vocabulary, and conventions, and tooling, to the tooling that preserves the great properties of WASM, with the portability, and the isolation, and the cross-language properties, and composability, we have the foundations for a WASM native API ecosystem. And we have the foundations for a platform where people want to do lots of different things, from cloud things, to neural network things, to cryptography, um, and also POSIX things. One of the concerns as we talk about these other greater APIs is do all the engines have to implement all the WASI interfaces? And uh, on the other side, we have concerns from developers saying, like, you know, WASI has all these APIs in it. Um, 
do developers need to know which engines support which interfaces? It's going to be a convoluted support matrix. How do I know what I can use? And so the component model has an answer to that as well, and it's called worlds. Worlds are a mechanism for defining subsets of APIs that can say, we have WASI file system and WASI sockets and environments variables and command line options, and we can pull that all together and call that a command world. Um, on the other hand, we have WASI messaging and WASI SQL and WASI HTTP, and we can put those all together and call that a cloud world. So these different worlds are both independent of each other. They can both define their own APIs and define a set of things you can work with in a particular world, which will directly map to a particular set of use cases, command line environment programs, or a set of use cases like cloud programs, want to be portable quite different clouds. And with that context, when we talk about WASI in the cloud, it makes a lot of sense. Um, thanks to the past Dan. Um, I'd like to take it further and talk about the world of the cloud. First and foremost, what is cloud? Well, a cloud is a condensed form of vapor of H2O, also known as water, you know, uh, floating on the atmosphere. You probably can't see it because we are inside the building. No, sorry, that was wrong definition. What I really was asking is what is the cloud, the cloud computing? Cloud computing is an on-demand delivery of IT infrastructures for hosting your applications, at least the very core of it. As the cloud evolves, more and more features and services being added to it. A cloud provider like AWS has over 200 unique services for your applications, and they provide things like highly available fault-tolerant blob storage. They provide fully managed, sharded, replicated database to application. They manage your networking. They manage your entire identity platform. So your application offset 80 or 90% of the features to a specific cloud provider. Obviously, it comes with a cost. You have to pay cash to them. But also, you have to know the cost of your mental. Developers are facing ever-increasing expectations of building scalable applications. And they need to learn a bunch of SDKs, runtime environments, and a set of APIs. So not only do they have to understand what features they need to add to their application, they also have to ask their question of, how much does it cost me when I change my mind? How much does it cost me when I was required to migrate from one platform to another platform? A lot of the technologies like Kubernetes, Service Mesh, Dapper, Knative, and many more simplify our life. Dapper proves that the concept of abstracting the layer of data plan operations like state management, pops up, and config really works and it's really what developers want. And I think as we're building a ecosystem for Wasm native APIs, it's really important to start standardizing and unifying a set of interfaces for building distributed applications. And thus, we propose a new world called Wasi Cloud Core. Written Wasi Cloud Core in the WIT IDL as a world it is made up with smaller worlds like YZ key value, YZ blob store, SQL, messaging, runtime config, and the distributed lock service that gives you 80% of the capabilities that your application probably uh, needs. And in this world, unlike the command world, which exposed lower level APIs like sockets, YZ Cloud Core only export a single HTTP handler, so that allows you to do this bursty function serverless way. And in your application that handle HTTP request, you can use key value to access whatever key value uh, stores you have or blob store or do uh, transaction execute queries with SQL. 
a repeating theme in this conference and when people talk about WASM is portability. And Dan also mentioned portability is one of the things among other that make WASM unique. I'd like to take this chance to categorize different layers of portability. On the bottom layer, we have CPU portability that allows you to have a binary that can port from one CPU architecture to another, like x86 to ARM. And the WASM module does exactly like that. On the middle layer, we have operating system portability. POSIX allows any application that use the POSIX system call to run on POSIX compatible operating systems. But WASM is more than POSIX. I think on the cloud environment for distributed applications, we need an even higher layer of portability. We need to isolate your core business logic by abstracting away all the capabilities. And this is a business, business logic portability. And how do we achieve this level of portability? Well, we take a look at distributed applications. We find common patterns. What are some of the services and APIs application needs to use? And we found that multiple services like Redis, AWS DynamoDB, or Azure Blob Storage, or Azure Cosmos DB, they all share a common set of APIs for key value store, which is get, set, delete, and exist. So if we put them together into an interface called key value read write, we get exactly like that. We get a get function that returns a key value, uh, a key value pair, a set function to set your key value pair, delete, and check if the key exists. Any application targeting this interface doesn't have to understand what's the underlying infrastructure that provides your key value capability. So that application ideally is extremely portable on different platforms that provide different key value implementations. However, however, it comes with a trade-off. If you want to use more advanced features like transactional APIs or batch operations on key value store, you don't get it because not so many key value store implement this kinds of uh, advanced features. And any key value store has their own uniqueness. So I think there is a relationship between portability and feature richness. And if we draw a diagram, it will be a curve like that. The more portability you get, the less feature you have. If we draw a dot on the upper left side, we have WASI HTTP proxy, which is a WASI world that gives you a HTTP handler for processing HTTP requests. And this world is extremely portable. It can be implemented by Envoy, by any other platforms. You can port your application targeting HTTP proxy from on-prem to the cloud, to constrained devices, to edge, to IoT devices. On the lower right side, we have a specific provide, provider world that is giving you a full set of features from a cloud provider. And that's extremely powerful, but at the same time, not so much portability. I think there is a sweet spot in this curve, which is on the middle, that we want YZ Cloud Core to have a set of core set of features that gives you 80% of the, that satisfy 80% of the application needs without sacrificing too much of portability. And that's the goal we want to achieve. To recap, YZ Cloud Core uses high-level APIs and the weight ideal to define interfaces. It gives you the business logic level portability because it uses the tool trends like weight bindgen to generate bindings. You, have, you can write less code that needs to be bundled with applications. It uses rich semantics, and so you don't have to define your I.O. types like op opaque types and it is programming language agnostic. Sorry, let me just replug here. All right, 
we got it. All right, uh, we've been experimenting a host implementation of WASI Cloud Core at Days Labs Microsoft over the last year, and we call it Slight. It embeds WASM time as the WASM runtime, and it uses WIT IDL to define interfaces for WASI Cloud Core. And when you, when you, after you build your application, when you deploy it to production or environment, you have to use a configuration file to bind a specific capability to the infrastructure. For example, you have to say this key value store capability used by my application is really talking to Redis, and that's in the, the deploy stage. And now I want to give you a demo. This is a very simple demo that shows a chat app that uses the messaging capability. And it starts a HTTP server and has three simple endpoints, login, send, and receive. The send will send a message to every people in that group, and receive will grab a message uh, to the user. So um, in this chat app, we have a configuration file called a slide file. And currently, we are using the messaging capability and it uses the, the file system implementation on my local machine. And let me just start the server and start the client side. All right, so log in to users, and you can say hello, and I can say hi back. So this very simple uh, chat app. And now, when I, I can simply change the configuration file without recompiling the application to use the net service, for messaging capability. I just need to run this again. And you can see hello from one side, and I can say hi back on the other side. And this is using Nats instead of my file system implementation. All right, and I didn't talk too much about the component model, uh, comp how this is, how everything works, and I highly recommend you to take a look at the future of component tooling talk by Peter and the guy. Um, and KubeCon, we have a tutorial workshop. It's a 45 minutes workshop that will do hands-on with WebAssembly microservices and Kubernetes, and we'll deploy this application to uh, AKS using Runwazi. And we have all the links uh, to each of the WASI proposals, and they are all in this back work, and we have the implementation of Slide here. And thank you so much. <laughs>